Some of you have heard this week for the very first time, possibly even, a new word, ethnodoxology. It comes from the two roots, ethne and doxos. I think most of you can guess what kind of meeting that leads to. Um, one of the formal definitions that we use, although we're in the process of redefining it, is ethnodoxology is a theological and anthropological framework guiding all cultures to worship God using their unique artistic expressions. Other closely related fields, other words that you'll hear are world arts, ethno arts, global arts, and things like that. Um, in the mid-90s, my husband, Bill, and I were in um, northern Siberia, serving as missionaries there, learning about the culture, and discovering the importance of this field of ethno arts, ethnodoxology. We were planting a multicultural uh, church. Uh, the church planters were all Russian, except for us, and so we were planting a very good little Russian church. And uh, we began to notice that the minority culture, the Saha, were just, they weren't resonating with these Russian artistic forms, um, the Russian church government, the way we sat in rows, used the Russian hymn book, the guitar, all of these things were not really resonating with them. They had a very rich system of music and arts that really were not getting any attention in our church. That's how I discovered this whole field. We left, began to study any intercultural studies, and um, eventually I uh, began to study ethnomusicology, and that led to where we are right now. Um, in 2003, because I felt so lonely in this study, I mean, in the mission I was at at the time, there was a complete and total lack of understanding of what I was doing. I was very marginalized. Um, in fact, it got so bad that they had to call in Dr. Roberta King <laughs> to come and solve the problem on the field with Robin. She was doing all these strange things. And um, I thank you for setting them straight. Yeah, it was... <laughs> Yeah, it was great. She got a, an experience of some Siberian heat, you'll yes. remember. It was the hottest thing she'd ever seen. Our winters are cold, but our summers are very hot. So anyway, um, she kind of uh, set a, uh, a better acceptance of ethnodoxology on our field, which was great. Um, but because of those struggles that I had with getting my mission to really accept this and support me in it, I decided to form, um, along with some other colleagues, together we formed the International Council of Ethnodoxologists, which is a, now a very large network of people who do this in mission. So my topic for this week was to talk about, okay, 15 years ago, um, ICE, the International Council of Ethnodoxologists, was started. How has it grown? Where is it going? How has it changed? Is there any dynamism, any growth in the field of ethnodoxology? I say yes, ethnodoxology has really, how we think about ethnodoxology has really changed in the last 15 years. We started out as a bunch of musicians, mostly, who were thinking about the term heart music. It was, heart music was a sh nice shorthand way of explaining to people um, how uh, the idea was that just as everyone had their own heart language, um, people had a heart music that they could connect to God with. Well, that was a great shorthand, but we soon realized that actually many people have more than one heart music. So we changed it to heart musics. In ICE, we began talking about heart musics. Well, soon, of course, ethnodoxology is not just music, but all of the arts. So then we started talking about heart arts and local arts, things like that. So our terminology began to slowly change. Um, and also another thing changed. When we first started, it kind of grew out of the missionary context where we were um, crossing cultures. Uh, we wanted to kind of right some of the wrongs that had been done in the area of music and the arts and to appreciate and affirm local cultures and their arts. Um, so it had a very missional impulse, the idea of going somewhere and not bringing your own arts, but encouraging the local arts that were there in those cultures. Well, um, nowadays, 15 years later, the world has changed. We have diaspora abounding. We have multi-ethnic contexts. So what started out as a very missional impulse is now we're seeing how ethnodoxology applies to the North American church and other urban churches 
excuse me, all around the world. So um, on the ICE board, we have two out of the eight people are specialists in multicultural worship, Josh Davis and Jae Woo Kim. And that's part of the DNA of ethnodoxology now is thinking about how we need to not only uh, worship from our own heart arts, but think about the other people on the other sides of us, the pew on, in the pews next to us. What is my brother or sister's heart arts that they need to be worshiping in? And also, what about those who in our communities around us who should be worshiping with us, but we're not connecting to their heart arts? How can we celebrate with the global arts of the world um, so this focus on multi-ethnic worship is, has also become an important part. It's not the only part of ethnodoxology, but it is important. Also, urban context. Today you heard Megan Meyer's great session, and her dissertation is fabulous, on just um, the urban arts of the world. And we call, um, uh, in, the, in linguistics, they talk about the language of wider communication, so these trade languages that go across cultures. We also talk about the arts of wider communication, so arts traditions that um, uh, can, can cross cultures, and hip-hop is, of course, one of those. Um, there's urban doxologies that happen as well. Um, David Bailey is doing urban doxology, creating things with a multi-ethnic group in Richmond, Virginia. Um, we also have diasporic context. Uh, recently, Joy Lee, a, a student in our program, wrote a great uh, master's thesis on the intersection of diaspora missiology and, and ethnodoxology. So where are we going? I would like to bring you a challenge. This is where I think it's going. This is where I would like to see it going. Um, right now, the study of ethnomusicology or global arts or ethno arts is still at the periphery of ethnomusicological theory of missiological theory and methods. But um, that, I think, is changing. And I think that these days, this meeting, these meetings that we're having here with a bunch of missiologists is a great step in that direction. I think it needs to happen more. I wish that ethnodoxology and global arts was not at the periphery of mission theory and praxis. Um, because artistic expression, which is really just form-heavy communication is at the core of how we as humans relate to one another, relate to God, and even how we relate to ourselves. It's how we understand things. So I believe that the future of missiology will acknowledge that artistic communication is a part of the core of the discipline, not merely arts as icing on the cake, but uh, there will be a recognition that arts are communication, powerful forms of communication. Someday, everyone will do ethnodoxology. They may not call it that, but they will do it. It will be part of their missiological reflection and praxis. It will be nothing special. It will be just, of course we do it this way. That's where I think ethnodoxology is going. Amen. That's great. I love that. Um, and just want to honor Robin Harris too, because, um, y'all, she's amazing. And, um, if you don't know her, you need to know her because she has a heart for networking people and for bringing people together to do what God is calling them to do artistically. And it's beautiful what he's doing in you. And also want to honor Roberta King, who has done so much work to pull all of this together. And, um, I know she's so much a part of, of so many of our stories and we love you. And like, there's so many other people out there that really we should just like stand and let us honor you. Um, cause the Lord has done so much, uh, in, in these people. Um, but I kind of laughed when I always laugh when people, uh, like call me distinguished. I don't know. I, I think, um, there, because what he's doing in me lately, um, is, <clears throat> See, the, the kingdom of God works backwards. And he's taken the beautiful things and he's hidden them from the wise and he's revealed them to little children. And I just never want to leave that place. And what he's doing in me is he's teaching me about, um, okay, I can pull myself together. Um, no, I can't really, but he, he's just teaching me the power of story and, um, and so I want to invite you into that place for a second. And I just, can I just tell you a story? Can we just all be children? 
And because uh, I love the dialogue and I love the the challenge that we've all just been surrounded by. It's been so beautiful and so good and so deep. Um, but there's this story. Um, a farmer goes out to sow his seed. And as he sows it, some of it lands on the path. And the birds come and they snatch it off before it has a chance to get into the ground. And other seed lands on rocky soil and it takes root and it springs up quickly. But then the sun comes out and it withers because it's not deeply rooted. And then some of the seed lands on the ground, but it grows among weeds and thorns. And the thorns choke the plant and it doesn't reach maturity and it doesn't bear fruit. But some of the seed lands on good soil and it takes root and it grows and it bears a harvest 30, 60, 100 times more than what was planted. And what does this mean? The word is logos. It's the word of God. And who is the word? Jesus. And the message of God, it gets planted in our hearts, right? And so Jesus says that the seed is the word and the word that falls on the path and the enemy comes and takes it away. Um, and if we think about it, uh, he says, those are the people in whom, whose hearts the seed is sown and then it, it gets stolen. Um, and then if you look at the rocky soil, the seed is sown it starts to grow, but the roots are shallow. These are the people that hear the word and receive it with joy, but then when trouble or persecution come, they fall away. <clears throat> and then the weeds and the thorns, they represent the anxieties, the pleasures of life, the things that worry us. How many of you have those things? And they choke the message and the life of Christ in us. And then you have the good soil. And in all of these things, the soil is our hearts. And a lot of times we identify as being the plant more than we identify with being the soil. The plant is the thing that grows. We are, we're so invested in our own growth. But that's not the picture that Jesus is painting for us. In this picture, we're just dirt. And so what's beautiful about dirt is that as creation was spoken into existence, humans were not. We were formed. We were handmade by a maker, by a potter who got clay, who got just dirt and formed us and fashioned us and breathed his life into us. And the beauty of this is that this story is transferable across cultures. And the story is such bare truth that it can draw us a picture of what contextualization looks like. And I love the stories of Jesus because it takes us back to just that place where we're ready to listen. Everybody's ready to hear a story. And story is art. And so when we look at how Jesus lived and how he ministered and how he interacted interfaith and uh, like interculturally, um, one of the stories that comes to mind is the Samaritan woman at the well where Jesus comes to her and she is drawing water. And what does he say? Does he say, let me tell you about living water. Here's what living water is. Da, 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 da. No, he says, can I have some water? And he asks for what she has, even though it falls way short of what he has to offer her. What he has is so much greater. What the Lord has for us is always better than what we have to offer him. And yet, because Jesus sees our core needs, not just our felt needs, he knows how to get at all those places in us that we can't even see about ourselves. And then he says, you know what I'm going to do with that? If you knew who was asking you this question, you would ask, and I would give you living water, which John 7, 38 through 39 says is the Holy Spirit. 
And that Holy Spirit fills us and meets every need. And not only that, but wells up and overflows back into the lives of people around us. So as soil with Christ planted in us, the seed of Abraham who roots down into us, the shoot of Jesse, who grows up out of us and bears fruit in us just as an automatic byproduct, a natural organic process of just being in us and us in him. The fruit is automated and we get to just rest and we get to just be wellsprings of this living water. So how does this relate to mission and the arts? The stories that Jesus gives us in his word, they become life when we retell those things. So for example, one of the um, uh, songwriting seminars that we did recently in Nicaragua with about 30 worship leaders, um, all we did was um, tell this story of the seed and the sower. And we said, okay, so if we're the soil and if the message of Christ for our community is planted in us, if Jesus is planted in us, Okay, then what does that mean is going to grow? What is he going to produce out of us and in us? What is going to be the fruit of Christ in us in this community? What are the deep needs of this community? And then we started talking about that. They said, oh, well, there's tons of, first of all, we're really poor. We haven't had water here in five years. Um, we, we, we haven't um, had unity in our churches. So, okay, well, what does the scripture say about that? And so we look at the scripture, we see what the scripture says about that and we say, okay, now break into groups and let's write a song about that. And so the method is simple. Just like the story of Jesus is simple. There's nothing magical or mysterious about ethnodoxology. It's just, what does it look like to be worshiping as soil out of what Christ is growing out of us and rooting down into us and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our communities. So yeah, we can just maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful thing to be here with all of you and especially with my good, good friends and longtime uh, friend and colleague, uh, Roberta and Roberta and Bill, thank you so much. I remember Bill uh, inviting me when he was at New College Berkeley and Geez, that was 80, 81, talking about worship and church growth. So some of us have been at this a, a long time, and I'm the, that's why I'm thrilled that this kind of a gathering, particularly here at Fuller, with so much impact around the world, is raising the issue of global arts and witness. The thing that I felt was um, important as a foundational issue to um, sort of remain in the uh, in the screen was really a, a foundational issue about the arts. For years, I kept wanting someone, uh, including our esteemed colleague, Bill Dernis, to give me a definition, a biblical definition of the arts. And frankly, I never exactly found it. So after three times at seminary, I started poking around in the Hebrew myself. And uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> so uh, I have really felt it important to not just talk just about the arts per se, which has a lot of uh, Western and Enlightenment baggage, but to broaden it as I see it in scripture to this dynamic of imaginative human expression. And of course, when all of us or many of us speak with church and mission and academic leaders, not in our area, they're kind of thinking, you know, what's this artsy fartsy stuff all about? And is it really essential in terms of proclaiming the revealed uh, truth of the word of God? Uh, lately, I've been saying that, remember uh, what the Bible is, it's really God's revelation about how reality works. And that begs a lot of questions that maybe allows us to start interacting uh, with people. But one of the issues Issues. The big issue is how, if God is holy and other, and many religious faiths and, uh, beyond Christianity, as you well know, have some sense of the highness and the holiness and the otherness of God or the uh, the force or whatever. And uh, yet this, we are proclaiming the reality that there is an objectively true God who loves us and who has created all, created us uh, for his purposes. And when we are in line with him and uh, uh, um, rightly relating to him, we bring human flourishing and the common good. 
So it's broad. It's bigger than religion. When I teach worship in the Old Testament, I say, what about Deuteronomy 23? I call it the poop passage. You know, what's up with, you know, telling the Israeli soldiers to carry a shovel and when they relieve themselves, cover their, uh, uh, their stuff. And uh, it's because God is interested in hygiene. He knows how the fallen world works and he wants us to be healthy and such. So do that. And I said, you see, God is not a religious God, but he's the true and living real God. God who loves us and even in our rebellion wants to buy us back and redeem this situation. So, okay, we're, we're, we're there. So the next question, or at least a big question I say is, how has God designed us, the God who is totally other, uncreated, but real and true and living, but created his creatures, which are frail and finite? How has he created us, whether before the fall or after the fall, uh, that we as finite people who have limited ability to apprehend, to embrace who he is, you know, he doesn't fit on our CD-ROM, on our hard drive. He's bigger than that. So how has he designed us that we actually might have intimate intercourse with him in this intimate way, walking as he intended us to walk with him in the garden. Well, uh, I suggest that it has to go beyond rational intelligence, which uh, we as uh, Protestants are interested in in some big ways for all kinds of very good and historical reasons and such. But this issue of of can, are there other dynamics to the way that human beings and human community live? And that's where we get to two other areas that I see in the Hebrew scriptures that are helpful. One is uh, imaginal intelligence, and uh, the second uh, uh, is emotional intelligence, and that ties with the third, rational intelligence. Okay, now, how does that relate to the arts? I was looking for uh, what's a biblical definition of what the arts are, because everybody in this room knows they're bigger than just painting a picture, doing a dance, singing a song, making a film, et cetera. Um, and I've, the best word I have found for artists in the scripture, we're talking about a person who has a, a more capacity than the normal human being at some of these uh, dynamic uh, um, abilities or capacities of, that we sometimes call aesthetic uh, and, and such. And the best best word I found is craftsman. Uh, and it means uh, um, someone who is unusually wise at imaginative design or expression. And that comes specifically from Dr. Ron Allen, who's my Hebrew prof. Uh, he teaches now in Dallas, but uh, he's done around. And I just tweaked it a little bit in conversation with him as I was looking at not just design, but design and expression. You know, that comes from uh, a main passage, Exodus 31 and Exodus 35, Basil and Aholia. Well, that begs another question. If, if that is, well, another thing, if we think about a person who's unusually wise and imaginative designer expression, we see that it's mo that term or the body of words is, uh, is modified by five other Hebrew wisdom words, wisdom, knowledge, skill, ability, and understanding. We also see those are the same five words that modify two other class terms that relate to our topic, and that's musician and singer, and there are sub- kinds of singers and musicians in the, in the scriptures. And they too are designed as um, uh, uh, wisdom, wise, knowledgeable, skilled, etc. That brings us to a place where we see that these are the people who have this unusual capacity uh, for imaginative expression. That begs a question, uh, it, does everybody have imagination? Cutting to the chase, yes, of course, we're made in the image of God. But the, the person we call an artistic person has an unusual dynamic of that, which means to fashion in your mind before you form it in time and place. And I see two sub-definitions. One, to see what could be before it is, Secondly, uh, the ability to look through observable realities like an altar or a cup or whatever and see into the deeper realities. And Orthodox folks love it when I speak about that. Uh, so we see that artists or these people unusually wise in imaginative expression have these kinds of capacities. So the last question that I'll raise here in my little time is where do we see, what do we see these people doing in scripture? What's the purpose of artistic or imaginatively rearranged human metaphors, symbols, and signal systems, a definition of the arts I'd suggest you fiddle with. Um, uh, what's the purpose? Well, we see these people creating environments wherein 
We actually, humans and human community, touch the transcendent realities of life. And most importantly, we touch the transcendent reality of God himself beyond an intellectual exercise, but in fact, a- an encounter, a phenomena of interaction, the mystery of God dealing with us, whether as an individual or a human, uh, a human community. And all human community needs these kinds of things in their own language and cultural expressions. Um, that's what maybe we can touch a bit more in our Q&A uh, together, but it underpins all of what we're talking about, because ultimately what we want the gospel to do uh, is to be manifest in the language and cultural style of every uh, human community, and so that people might get saved, but also that human flourishing and human good might be accomplished, and then that inf- infects and impacts even uh, the creation and such. All this to say, artists are ex- especially important as the people who can create these environments wherein human beings can enter and touch the transcendent realities of God himself and then also of life. And that transcends even our religious perspective. But at the core, it has to do with us interacting with the Lord himself. And that impacts everything we're talking about here and the missional agenda of the church until he comes again and takes us into things that uh, he will, and we won't try to solve all those things today. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Let me quickly say, in light of the overall uh, conversation we've been having this week, uh, and in light of what I'm going to say, I have way more questions right now than I have answers. Um, uh, uh, And I am very glad that uh, Professor Philip Jenkins of Baylor University reviewed my book in the Christian Century and said it's a crisp read that you will uh, read in one sitting and then go back and read again with a pen and paper. So go pick up that. But that is to underscore, I wrote this book uh, to generate conversation not to create the final word on megachurch Christianity. And I am hoping that we can raise far more conversations out of each and every chapter in that book. Uh, And it's in that spirit that I want to throw a spanner uh, that may feel a little bit out of turn, but I want to throw a spanner into the conversation we're having here. Um, Give me a second. All right. Evangelical Christianity, as detailed um, in in the recent publication, Still Evangelicals, Insiders Reconsider Social and Theological Meaning, is in a state of great flux. Urgent considerations have been made on the political and social issues. One of the arenas of flux is theology, and one of the expressions of theology is worship. For the last four decades, One of the distinctives of worship in evangelical leaning churches has been a focus on crafting and practicing the kind of worship intended to attract a younger crowd into church. To do so has meant experimentation with language adaptation, inclination towards uh, celebrity culture and dependence on technology. For its stated purposes, this kind of worship and accompanying seeker-friendly sermons has worked. The inspirational focused music, high energy, electronic powered stage performances, sophisticated loud sound systems, discotheque lighting, screen projection, lyrical versatility, uh, experiences of love, belonging, acceptance, uh, invitations into those kinds of experiences, all this and more deeply resonate with a young crowd. What is also to be said is that the resonance has to do with the fact that such young adults would have experienced similar performances in other secular entertainment sports. So what is not to like? On the surface of it, nothing. It works. And at a basic level, it makes profound sense. Contemporary Christian worship has brought back the young adults into church, 
because it is part of, a, of an overall package of a message that seems to set the world to rights after so much has seemingly gone wrong. I have argued in Megachurch Christianity Reconsidered that churches that grow to megachurch size, starting with a small and big, uh, small size to big size, uh, need to be understood as offering a home for a homeless generation. That is a generation in transition in multiple life folds of social change through the macro social processes of urbanization, capitalist mode of economic production, bureaucratic and economic arrangements of state organization, global and uh, diffusion of all social, technological and cultural products. We often do not consider the comprehensive impact of all these transitions on how in the individual experiences modern life but without the filter of the sacred canopy that defined earlier generations, that is reliable family networks, uh, functional institutions like church and stable government, the compounding impact is a sense of cognitive and cultural dissonance. And in this context, the rise of churches that grow to mega size make profound sense. The contemporary young adult, indeed any young adult generation as it comes of age, not only finds itself having to make sense of individual developmental life, uh, the right relationships, a community, it also must make sense of multiple social transitions in order to find its place in the world. The practical stuff. All this, um, uh, all this makes the world uh, feel deeply. All these transitions make the world feel deeply volatile. The result of which is the individual, the communal, the social brokenness as experienced today and as experienced by every generation going through transition. It is in the cusp of transitional crisis that new, often young leaders emerge and rewrite their own transitional experience into a map of reality that makes comprehensive sense of the changing world and invites others to participation. And that's why they attract the young adult generation right back to church. But here's my argument. Megachurch Christianity is in need of a maturing sense of self-consciousness. We have come to take it for granted as a reality that it, uh, has occupied uh, the contemporary ecclesial context. But in fact, uh, there is a need to revisit the conversation, hence reconsidered. Social commentary, that is media and social demographers, have it that numerical attendance is in decline. I do not think that decline is the core problem. First, new generations are always coming of age and they need to be evangelized. And with the right methods, they are responsive to the gospel. But there is a significant factor uh, when the diet is only milk. Second, the mega church movement has reinvented itself into smaller franchising units patterned under the models of corporate leadership. Think conference circuits on church planting movements, leadership, discipleship, and missions uh, conferences that we all attend. Uh, in which, incidentally, like old Israel, uh, when there was no king, everyone is doing their own thing. Um, uh, in, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as they pleased. And is that part of the larger problem? What this really means is that there will always be entrepreneurial church planters, including those that develop churches that become mega. The ebb and flow, at least, uh, we can uh, foresee it might continue for another generation or so. It is the witness of the Christianity in these churches to the wider society that begs the question as raised by social and political dramas of our times. Although the theological community has worked hard at big issues as framed by the broader social conversation, that is issues of race, social justice, gender, politics. My hunch is that we will not resolve contemporary social dramas as they affect the church uh, until we investigate the grassroots theology embedded in worship and sermons and community formation practices. Franchising mega church signed 
franchising mega church kind of Christianity, I am a Kikuyu, uh, <laughs> represents one of those vibrant platforms of this theology. Let me say that again, franchising mega church kind of Christianity. So do not hear me speaking about size. Think of the small franchises that are emerging out of the larger networks. That kind of Christianity re uh, um, represents one of those vibrant platforms of this grassroots kind uh, of theology. I argue that in chapter six and chapter seven, uh, the concluding chapter of the book. In this platform, I do not have time to go into detailed uh, explorations that dovetail into this very large topic. I will merely raise one or two concerns that require deeper reflection. One is that contemporary Christian worship ref reflect in the words of Thomas Bagler's book uh, by the same title, The Juvenilization of American Christianity, that is the focus on reaching the youth and meeting their needs, entertainment seeker friendly, as well as the corporatization of church leadership practices with growth as the main goal. And as I have argued, it has helped to reach uh, and bring back the young into the church. The question, as was raised at my, as, at my table discussion, is what happens five, 10 years after these people have been coming to church and they just cannot survive on the diet of milk uh, alone. Second, a second big issue, aside from 20th century social and cultural wars, is the absence of a historical consciousness of all the wealth from 2000 years of Christian history, including music and art within the franchising mega churches. And therein lies the resource for enhancing the Christian maturity within the mega church movement itself. And that where the rubber meets the road for me as a scholar of world Christianity is that the social and cultural conflicts alongside the political and economic dramas of co-optation here in America are beginning to be worryingly felt and reflected in evangelical Christianity in many parts of the global South. In the table discussions and in conversations, I've had great uh, exceptional examples, but those are the exceptions. The, 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 the thriving mega uh, uh, world Christianity is greatly in need of finding its own self-consciousness. Um, and a lot of things are being reflected from what is happening within American Christianity. So for all the numbers in the rising Christianity across the global South and for all our post-colonial critique and for the splendid examples of the cultural consciousness in specific and particular communities, the overall trajectory of whatever happens within the various strands of American Christianity exercises a very strong influence elsewhere. And I'm doing double listening for that. So I have argued that size, uh, um, uh, the typology, not size, represents a grassroots theology of worship and arts, leadership, organization, uh, community, life, and mission. And they are all a package. Here we have looked at, at arts, uh, 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 at the art, but it's all a larger package for the modern world. And we need to revisit the mega church as a resource to, uh, to develop, not just a, uh, to de develop this grassroots theology into a fuller and more complete expression of theology. Uh, and a parallel in closing, and I'll stop reading and make a parallel here. I made it a table conversation earlier today. In the 1950s and 1960s, Returning missionaries took the grassroots theology of missions and brought it to Fuller. And they used that to create what we now have as the School of World Missions and the, 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 the School of Intercultural Studies. And that for the last generation has resourced and resourced the missions movement with solid theology and is the result of why we are here. My argument is that the grassroots theology of mega churches, our, our tendency is to look at the preachings of the popular preachers and look down on them in disdain for what they're not preaching right. Say, for example, for prosperity or pro positive thinking or too much emphasis on money or that sort of thing and blessings and that kind of thing. 
But my argument is that it is the work of the theological institution now, thinking about the next generation to take that theology, develop curriculums, develop institutes, I don't know, move the conversation forward. <laughs> Please, let's pick it up uh, here at the discussion. <laughs> Shinido, eh, me, it is Shinido.